children lost, ensnared by a witch's binding spell. Jessaline, the awakened soul, yearns to escape and find a new home. Dare you join her and explore more? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I am so excited for today's video because we're talking about Corpse Bride. This movie, where do I even begin? I love this movie. Listen, I love Coraline and I feel like this movie is like almost as good as Coraline. Like it's right there. Like they're basically the same thing. And I saw so many comments from you guys telling me to review this movie and talk about all the hidden secrets and all the things that you might have missed when you watched when you were younger. I also got a ton of comments asking me to do the same same thing for Nightmare Before Christmas. So I am gonna do that as well and hopefully that'll be up in a couple like two, three days. It seems like you guys really like stop motion animation, which is really cool. So please comment down below what other videos you would like me to do because I will <laughs> I will do them all. I even got some people saying they want me to do Monster House, which <laughs> I can do that too. <laughs> Your wish is my command, you know what I mean? But yeah, today we are going to be covering Corpse Bride. <laughs> All right, so let's get right into this video. Things that only adults notice in The Corpse Bride. And I feel like some of you might have been offended last time I had that as a title. Really what it means, like to sum up the meaning of this title, is just things that you may not have noticed when you watched this movie for the first time or when you were younger. And even if you did notice these things, maybe you didn't realize the deeper symbolism, you know what I mean? So it's always interesting to do these videos because you guys might be watching and you might be like, wow, I've seen that film 50 times, but I know I never noticed that. <laughs> It was the same thing for the Coraline video. Like so many of you guys were like mind blown. And speaking of the Coraline video, I am doing one more Coraline video for you guys coming up in a couple days because so many of you guys commented on that video with your own fan theories and things I never even noticed. So I'm doing one more Coraline video where I read and react to the theories that you guys came up with about Coraline because whoa, they're mind blowing too. But anyways, we're talking about Corpse Bride today. So Corpse Bride has my full attention right now. So here's the very first point. Many of you may not have noticed or known about this, but the Corpse Bride is actually based on a Russian Jewish folktale, which I had no idea about until I researched for this video. So this is how the Russian folktale actually goes, and it's very similar to the movie. Once upon a time, there was a young man who lived in a village in Russia. He was to be married, and he and his friends prepared to go to the village where his bride-to-be lived. It was a two-day walk from his own village. So he's engaged to be married to this girl, so him and his friends were going on a little trip to go and meet her. So because it was a really long journey, they decided to take camp in this forest by a river. And this man who was engaged to be married, he was walking through this forest where they were camped out, and he saw this unusual looking stick coming out of the ground. It kind of looked like a finger. So this man and his friends were laughing at it. They thought it was hilarious. They were joking around. And he thought it would be funny if he took his wedding ring and put it onto the finger of this weird looking stick. Sounds familiar, right? What's different though about the movie and this folktale is that this man started doing the wedding dance around the stick. It was like, whoa, da, 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 you know, like a wedding, I don't know, whatever a wedding dance would be. And him and his friends are dying of laughter, but that's when the hand started to move and out of the ground came this creepy, disheveled corpse. Of course, in this real life folktale, she was a lot scarier looking than the animated version because her skin was falling off. She was like, there's spider webs all over her. She was gross. She was disgusting. So I guess Tim Burton found out about this folktale and decided to base his movie off of that, which I thought was so cool. The next point that you guys may not have noticed is that the grave that Emily is buried, she's right in front of this really creepy big tree, right? Well, that tree is the same tree that Tim Burton used in Sleepy Hollow. They just made it into like an animated version and they slightly changed the shape and made it more, you know, unique to that movie. If you guys have never seen Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow, it's such a good movie. Johnny Depp is in that movie as well, but it's a story about the Headless Horseman. It's really creepy. 
be really eerie and that tree I've always found to just be so cool looking and creepy so I love how he incorporated that into Corpse Bride as well. The next point, I wish I never read this because it kind of ruined the movie for me. Victor puts the wedding ring on the wrong finger <laughs> and I also should have noticed this because I am engaged. I know what finger that you're supposed to put the ring on. This is the finger, this one, okay? Not your pointer finger. So if you're watching the movie, her hand is kind of up like this. This is her pointer finger and he puts the ring on that one, which is not the finger that you put when you're engaged. But then when she actually gets up out of the ground and she's standing there, somehow the ring is on the right finger. So I guess it was like a goof in editing and animating, which like that happens sometimes, but now I'll never unsee it. And every time I watch it, I'm gonna be like, that's the wrong finger, Victor. That is the wrong finger. <laughs> the next point that goes with this scene as well is that Victor never says the words I do when he's in the forest. And this might be getting a little bit nitpicky, but when Victor is practicing his vows in the woods, first of all, there's no like priest there to legalize the vows anyway. And when Emily comes out of the ground, she's the only one that says I do. And legally to like be bound together in marriage, Victor would have to say I do as well. So technically she didn't have claim over him because he didn't say I do, but like she was like, oh, now we're married. But really, if you think about it logically, they weren't, but it's okay. I'll forgive that. The next point is the Vincent theory. Lord Finnis Everglot accidentally refers to him as Vincent instead of Victor. If you guys didn't know, Vincent is actually another film that Tim Burton did. It was a short film. And the whole story is about this kid who wishes that his name was Vincent Price. And there are so many fan theories floating around on the internet that says that maybe this Vincent from the movie, maybe that was the kid version of Victor. And like when he grew up, he changed his name to Victor. I don't know, but a lot of people are saying, hey, the guy in Corpse Bride, that's like the adult version of like Vincent. So I don't know what you guys think of that, but people are saying that Tim Burton films are just all connected somehow. So there you go. The next point is the Harryhausen tribute. I hope I'm saying his name properly. But if you remember when Victor is at Victoria's house, he sits down by the piano and he starts playing. Now, if you look at the piano, there's a little label that says Harry Hughesen or Howie, H Howie. <laughs> Harry Hausen, and that's actually another stop motion artist that inspired Tim Burton. And what's so weird is if you guys have seen Monsters Inc., there's also a Harry Hausen mention in there because one of the restaurants in Monsters Inc. is named after him. So I just feel like a lot of people are inspired by him and they try to put his name in different films. So that's kind of cool. This next point is actually a goof that I have never noticed before when I watched this when I was younger, and I can't believe I haven't because it's so obvious. It's called the chicken mistake, <laughs> which sounds kind of weird. But in the scene where Lord Barkus and Victoria are having their like wedding dinner, you can see that all of the guests are served chicken. Like they're all sitting there with this plate with a big chicken on it, every single person there. But then when all the skeletons come and like interrupt the feast, suddenly their chicken has been replaced by soup. <laughs> And it's like such a quick change and it just doesn't make any sense when you actually think about it because one second they have a big thing of chicken and the next second all the chickens are gone and there's like a soup bowl. Because remember the part where he was like, there's an eye in me soup. <laughs> and like I said, you guys will probably never unsee that. <laughs> Kind of the downside of watching videos like this is now next time you watch the movie you're gonna see all of this stuff i'm mentioning and definitely comment down below if you've noticed this before because if you have then you you a genius right there the next point is the meaning of the butterflies because obviously at the end of the film you can see all of those like blue butterflies around emily it's really pretty it's a very like emotional scene at the beginning of the film if you can remember victor is examining a butterfly that seems to be in like a glass case but then he lets it go because obviously he prefers for it to be free. So the whole meaning of butterflies in this film is freedom. And I think even in real life, the butterfly symbolizes like freeing your soul and being alive and just like freedom. So at the end, when she kind of flies away with the butterflies, it's just like her making peace with herself. She's done the right thing. Her past isn't haunting her anymore. Like she's just free, you know? Now I feel like this last point I'm gonna talk about is a very like controversial one, but I would love to hear all of your opinions. The question is, is the ending of the film 
actually a happy one? Are people actually content with how the film ended? Was Victor actually happy? Because the way it ended, it almost seems like it was intended to be a happy ending, you know, with Victor and Victoria ending up together. But from the audience perspective, watching the film, you kind of wonder to yourself, would he have been better off with Emily? Especially because Emily and Victor were the main focus of the whole entire film, and they ended up getting so close by the end of it. You know, they grow fond of each other, and think about that classic scene where they're sitting at the piano doing the duet. That scene was so intimate and so special, and ugh! It's just so confusing because maybe he's just torn. Like, I feel like he'd be just as content living with the dead and living with Emily as he would be living with the living and living with Victoria. This is like a tongue twister, guys. I mean, think back to the start of the movie, and this is why the whole thing is confusing, is because at the start of the movie, Victor meets Victoria, they instantly have a connection, and you're like, yeah, I want them together. But then he goes and he meets Emily, and at first she seems so annoying and so mean. She basically seems like a monster. <laughs> but then as the movie goes on, the corpse bride becomes more and more likable, and I feel like the audience start to gravitate towards her more than Victoria. And that just makes everybody wonder, shouldn't Victor be with the corpse bride? So I'm gonna end off the video asking you guys this question. Who do you think Victor really loves, okay? I just, just comment it down below, let me know, who do you think he really loves? Today we're gonna talk about all the things that you may have missed in Nightmare Before Christmas when you watched this when you were younger, and I cannot wait to just show you guys what you missed and what was hidden. A ton of these things I didn't even notice until I did research for this video, as I always say. So I'm so interested to hear from you guys what things really surprised you in today's video. I just gotta say, I think Nightmare Before Christmas is like in the top of my favorite Tim Burton films ever. I think it might be second in line. I really like Edward Scissorhands as well. Those two are like kind of tied. Corpse Bride is obviously way up there. He's just Everything Tim Burton is just bae. Like, can I call a movie bae or is that weird? But I just cannot wait to cover this today. Woo! It might be kind of long because I have a lot of stuff to talk about, but that's even better, right? Like, everybody loves a lot of movie. I need to calm down. I'm talking so fast. <laughs> so I think we're just gonna jump right into this because I don't know what else to say. I'm just excited to start. I think before I get into the things you may not have noticed, I have kind of a question for all of you guys to answer right now. I want you to comment down below. Is Nightmare Before Christmas a Halloween film or a Christmas film? I feel like so many people around the internet, around the internet, I feel like so many people everywhere have just been confused and kind of torn between which one it actually is. A lot of people say both, but I feel like it's sort of more one than the other. I found a lot of articles online and I feel like people are directed more towards it being a Christmas film. And this is sort of someone's explanation as to why. In my opinion, it's a Christmas movie. Think about it. The story begins just as Halloween is ending, whereas a usual Halloween movie would hit its climax on Halloween. That's kind of true. When the movie starts, Halloween is ending. Like Halloween is over by the time the film is actually kind of getting into what's happening. And they move on to Christmas right away. Away. So usual Halloween films take place on Halloween, right? Like through the whole movie. But in this instance, it's Christmas most of the time. Also, the story involves characters learning the true meaning of Christmas, which is the most well-worn of all Christmas movie plots. But obviously, you can watch this movie whenever you want. If you want to watch it on Halloween and Christmas, you do you. I love that movie. I could watch it all year round, every day of the year. I'll watch it on Easter. <laughs> but yeah, I'm just so curious to know which one you think it more is, more of a Halloween movie or more of a Christmas movie. So one of the things that you might have missed in the film is that there are so many missing holiday trees. The holidays celebrated by the vast majority of human population go unrepresented, which I find a little strange. So if you're looking at a picture of all of these trees, it's only a few of the holidays that we're familiar with, but there's so many more that they missed. And like what I find so weird to think about is, okay, so Jack Skellington is in charge of Halloween Town, right? They always sort of have like a person in charge like in Christmas Town, Santa's like in charge. So like for the turkey door for Thanksgiving, is the turkey in charge? Is it like this big turkey like walking around in charge of everybody? And what is the door with the firecracker on it? Like what does that mean? Is that the 4th of July door? And another thing that you might not have noticed is that the doors aren't lined up in chronological order. Like you'd think they 
might be in order, you know, of what time they come in the year. Cause like the turkey door is between Easter and Christmas, which doesn't happen in real life. So they're kind of just mixed up, which like isn't a big deal. You know what I mean? It just makes you wonder like why? Another thing people were wondering is there's an entire town dedicated to Halloween. So, you know, Halloween town, but they don't celebrate Halloween the way that like us people are used to, like how Halloween is traditionally celebrated. Like their way of celebrating is lighting a skeleton on fire. <laughs> which you know, we don't do in real life. And you don't see them like trick or treating. Do you even see candy in Halloween town? So it's just interesting how that town is supposed to represent what we know as Halloween, but they do things very differently. But then like in Christmas town, they do things how we're normally used to it. So it's just, it's like a strange contrast there. And like candy is a big part of Halloween to like leave out, but maybe I just missed it. Maybe there is candy, let me know down below. <laughs> the next question a lot of people have is how did Jack book become the pumpkin king? Like how is he? How was he the pumpkin king? Was he forced to be the pumpkin king? Because you know, when you listen to the song Jack's Lament, one of the lyrics in that song says, I'd give it all up if I only could. So it's almost like he was forced or maybe he was like born into it. I don't know. But it, he almost makes it seem like he has no choice. Like he has to be the pumpkin king. And I would love to know the history behind that. You know what I mean? Like what's stopping him from giving it all up? And like, like retiring as the Pumpkin King. Also, the song implies that the Pumpkin King title has to go to the scariest resident of Halloween Town because he says in his song, there are few who deny at what I do I am the best. So like scaring people. And here's the thing that people are confused about. Maybe you are too. Do you think Jack is the scariest person in Halloween Town? Because personally, especially at the beginning of the film, I see so many scarier monsters. Like, have you guys seen the thing hiding under your bed at the beginning of the movie? Or what about that creepy clown with the tearaway face? <laughs> like a clown with a tearaway face. Like to me, Jack is like, honestly, I'm not even gonna deny it. I had a bit of a crush on Jack when I was a kid. <laughs> and like, how can you have a crush on a skeleton? But like when you're a kid, you're like, oh, Jack, can I be your Sally? <laughs> so like to me, I thought Jack was like really cool, not so much scary, but let me know what you guys think. Also, if Jack is the king of Halloween town, why is there a mayor that's giving all of the orders? Like why is there this annoying guy that's the mayor that's telling everyone Everybody what to do when clearly Jack is the king of Halloween Town. Why isn't he the one giving the orders? You know what I mean? I never noticed that as a kid, but like watching it back, the, the mayor's like all in your face all the time, you know? The next point, why is everyone okay with the way Dr. Finkelstein treats Sally? Sally is basically a slave and she's held against her will, forced to do labor and spends much of the movie trying to escape from her cruel master. And that's already like a super messed up thing to think about. But what's even more messed up in my opinion is that everybody in the town is like aware of her situation. Jack is aware of her situation, but no one helps her. And Jack's a pumpkin king and he like is supposed to love her or like she loves him and they have they have a connection or whatever. And he doesn't like get her out of her situation. You know what I mean? Is no one concerned? I didn't like take that in until recently where I was like, wait, everyone knows. Jack knows, but yet she's still this slave who's like abused. Next point, why is Jack the only one who got bored of Halloween? So if you think about it, they spend the entire entire year preparing for this one day of Halloween. So every day to them is Halloween, literally. Imagine like preparing for like Easter every day of the year. It would start to get like really tiring and really boring. And they've been doing this their whole entire lives, like everybody in Halloween town. And Jack seems to be the only one curious of what else is out there. Don't you think more people would kind of like be like Jack and get bored quickly? Or is that just me? And listen, I love Halloween. I would love to celebrate it for like days on end, but like a whole year, <laughs> that's a lot. And like to not have any other holiday or not know anything different, it would get really overwhelming. Next point, how did nobody in Christmas town notice a six foot skeleton running around? <laughs> he's literally running all over town, like jumping and singing and dancing. Like he's making himself known. He clearly doesn't look like he belongs there, but no one really seems to care or like say anything or look shocked. But I mean, maybe he just blends in with the snow. You know, he's white, snow's white, they just, they just mesh together maybe. So Jack says in the movie that he read all of the Christmas books so many times. Like he's done like his research on Christmas. Like he's read a ton as you guys could see. But then why does he call Santa Claus Sandy Claus? Like I'll put the name up here. He says Sandy Claus. He says his name completely wrong, but yet he's researched it so much. How does he get it wrong when he's been researching it? And oddly enough, it's 
oogie boogie that says Santa Claus's name right. But I mean, you also could say that maybe Jack says it as Sandy Claus because he's programmed in his brain to make everything scary. So even Santa Claus, who's supposed to be this like jolly, happy person, Jack in his mind just automatically makes him into a scary thing because he's from Halloween Town, you know? The next thing that you may not have noticed, did you realize that Jack went back into Halloween Town through a gravestone? when he was in Christmas Town, And I thought that the doors in the forest were the only way to get through each dimension. You know what I mean? But he went back through a gravestone. Like he casually just opens a grave and just like walks down into Halloween Town. So do all gravestones lead to Halloween Town? And the other question a lot of people have, if he goes down through a grave to Halloween Town, is Halloween Town actually H-E double hockey sticks? You know what I mean? Is that what it actually is? Cause whoa, that's deep. Through researching, I found that a lot of people think that Jack Skellington is a little bit egotistical, which I can kind of see if I look back on it, but I still love him so much. Like, I love that guy. Like, he thinks he could do Christmas better than Santa Claus himself, who, Santa Claus is literally Christmas, and Jack Skellington thinks that he can do it better than the, the man himself. And the fact that he's so quick to jump over to Christmas Town and take over everything makes me wonder if he's done that for any other holidays. You know what I mean? Because he it seems like he gets bored really easily. Maybe he's done that in different areas. Does he just get bored all the time and obsess over other places? Like, honestly, me though. <laughs> the next question. Why did Jack trust Lock, Shock, and Barrel to take care of Santa? Why not trust someone else that he knows and loves like Sally? Because Sally would never betray him. Like, those kids look so sketchy, so mischievous. No wonder they took Santa to Oogie Boogie. Because like, how could you trust them? Why would Jack trust them? The other question is why has nobody else found the holiday trees. Like nobody else in Halloween Town has ever mentioned them because when Jack stumbles across them, he's never heard of them. He's never seen them. He's like shocked to see them. And it's weird because when he found them, he had only been walking through the forest for I think one night. So it didn't even take him that long. Does no one ever walk through the forest and find them? Why is this not like a well-known thing? It's almost like Jack is just the only curious person around. Oh, and the other thing that people are noticing, which I never noticed as a kid either. How come Jack didn't exit the Halloween door tree and then like find himself in the circle of trees. Cause he kind of just stumbles upon all the trees, but if the Halloween door is in front of him, why didn't he come out of it? Does that make sense? The next thing that people are noticing and asking questions about is what color is Sally's hair? Like what color is it actually? Is it brown or is it red? In the movie, it looks dark brown, like in every single scene. If you guys rewatch that movie or look at like clips or screenshots, her hair is always like this dark brown color. But in all of the Nightmare Before Christmas merchandise and all of the Halloween costumes out there, her hair is this really, really bright red. But how come we don't see that bright red in the movie? Isn't that bizarre? That's like a conspiracy. Like it's actually making me like spiral into my brain. Like how is that possible? Every picture of her is dark hair. This might be a really weird question, but um, how can a skeleton blink? <laughs> because the way things blink is you have the, the fleshy part of your eyelid, right? Cause that's not bone. So that's how you blink. But if he's a skeleton, you shouldn't be able to blink. But in the movie he blinks. Did you notice that as a kid? Cause I noticed that now. The last question that you may not have noticed and this like has no meaning at all really. But why does the spider on the mayor's shirt only have six legs? Okay, it's bothering my OCD. Why, why don't they have all the legs on the spider? I feel like that's a weird question to end this video with, but like why? <laughs> I could not believe how many of you guys wanted me to cover this film. And to be honest with you, I hadn't seen Monster House since I was like 12 years old. So about two nights ago, Ty and I had to sit down and rewatch it because I would never want to cover a film that I hadn't seen in a long time because I would like miss certain details. So we rewatched Monster House and gosh, it's so much darker than I remember it. But like I always say, it's so different to watch a film when you're a kid and then to watch it again when you're adult because you notice so much more watching it when you're older than you did. There are so many references in Monster House that went over my head when I was young. So that's why today's video is called Things Only Adults Notice in Monster House. And yeah, I'm just excited to cover this. Today's gonna be a two-part video. So the first half is going to be about Monster House and the second half is going to be about the It 2 trailer. If you have not watched the it 2 trailer yet. Please pause this video right here, open a new tab, go watch the It 2 trailer. Oh. 
oh, it's crazy, and then come back here. So just so you're kind of like caught up, you know what I mean? The reason why I'm finishing off today's video with the It 2 trailer is because there's not enough to say about it to make it its own video. So I thought I would just add it to the end of like one of my usual ones. Let's get into what only adults notice in Monster House. So just in case you did not know, Monster House is about three teens that discover that their neighbor's house is really a living, breathing, scary monster. Could you imagine that actually happening in real life? Like, <laughs> I'm literally sitting in a room right now that has a window leading to my neighbor's house. So I'm just imagining their house just turning into this really creepy beast. <laughs> that would be so scary. So today I just want to talk about the really messed up dark parts about the film that I didn't really linger on when I was a kid. The first fact that really disturbed me when I was re-watching it is that the babysitter for DJ is literally a bully, but yet every single week she continues to look after DJ. What doesn't really make any sense to me is why DJ wouldn't tell his parents about what she does. I mean, when I was a kid and I had babysitters, if the babysitter was ever like rude to me or did something wrong, I was that kid that would go to their parents and tell on the person. And I know that sounds horrible, but if your babysitter is literally a bully, you have to tell somebody. You can't just let her come back every single week. Like she literally shows up to the house wearing a bun, wearing nice clothes, and then walks in. The second she steps into the house, she like rips out her ponytail, her hair comes over her face. She's wearing this like gothic punk outfit, which is like super cool and all if you had a good personality. There's just something so wrong about babysitters taking advantage of having the house to themselves and looking after kids. Like that's a serious job. I'm just like so shook about it. I don't know why. When I was watching this, I was so mad at this babysitter. And then to make things even worse than it already was, Bones, this drummer guy and the babysitter's boyfriend is invited over, which is already like a no-no. When you're babysitting, you don't invite like random strangers over parents don't know about. Oh my gosh, when I have kids in the future and if my babysitter ever invites random dudes in the house with my kids. <sighs> so that was already upsetting. And then this guy's just like drinking bottles of beer. He tears apart DJ's favorite stuffed animal. Like both this babysitter and Bones are terrible people. And the next thing that I found really, really inappropriate was that downstairs when the babysitter and Bones was on the couch, he was like on top of her, like attacking her, like play attacking, but she was was still like, no, no, get off of me. And like, he wouldn't. And I'm like, what am I even watching right now? I don't know. Just like the first 15 to 20 minutes of the movie is all that. And it just gave me some really weird vibes. And I feel like as a kid, when I watched it, I was like, oh, like, I guess his life sucks. But like, you know, it's just the plot of the movie. <laughs> But when you get older, you just like, you want to protect all the children. <laughs> the next thing we find out is that Chowder's mom is cheating on his dad. And I never caught this when I was a kid watching the movie. In fact, I almost didn't catch it when I watched it two days ago. Ty had to point this out to me. Basically, Chowder is talking to DJ on the phone. And I think DJ asks like where Chowder's parents are or something like that. And Chowder replies with, my dad is at the pharmacy and my mom is at the movies with her personal trainer. And Ty looks at me and he's like, I think Chowder's mom is cheating on her dad. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes. I never got that reference before. Like, why would you go out on a movie date with your trainer. I think that was supposed to be like a funny part or something. Cause when I was a kid, I remember like my parents laughing when that part was said, but I never really understood it until now. The next thing I wondered when watching the movie is how was Nebercracker never arrested? I mean, you see the way he acts in public when he steps out of his house. Clearly he's just like assaulting children, grabbing their arms, grabbing them and pulling them away, breaking their bikes, stealing their toys. I mean, he's literally the definition of somebody who would be arrested if this movie was taking place in real life. He like screams, goes after people. A sad little newspaper boy could go up to his house and he would like attack the poor child. I mean, how has nobody called the cops on him? How has nobody witnessed this? Like when he's doing this to children, where are the adults? It's just weird that he's been living there for that many years. What do you say, 40 years or something? And no one's like, 
been concerned about the way he acts? And like the people that the house eats, why is there not more like missing persons cases? Why has Nevercracker not been investigated? The fact that he has a cement body in the basement of his house that no one's found out about is disturbing. That was the other part that I forgot about the movie when I watched it as a kid. I forgot it actually shows the cement body in the basement. Like these kids find the cement body of the lady who died. It's almost like this is more of an adult movie that's just been animated. Because how do you watch this when you're young and not be completely terrified and have like nightmares after? So yeah, they find this lady's body encased in cement in the basement of the house. And then something I think falls on it and the cement breaks and underneath you can see her actual skeleton. That is some disturbing content for a kid's film. And I mean, this story is sort of sad, but at the same time, it's really messed up. I mean, think about it. So. Nevercracker was building his wife's house, okay? During the process, she falls, hits the ground where the house is being built, cement falls on her, encases her, and instead of, hey, going to the police, telling somebody, he still continues to build his house around her body? Huh? When I watched this as a kid, I was kind of like, oh, he loves her and he still wants to build the house. No, that's creepy as heck. And what I found really strange is that there were witnesses when she fell and died. So why didn't those witnesses go and tell somebody? There was literally kids on their lawn on Halloween trying to get candy. And the reason why she fell backwards is because she was getting mad at them and then like lost her balance and fell. So they saw the whole thing. Why has he never been caught? And then like during the end of the movie when the house went full monster mode, was transforming into a very scary beast house, no one in the neighborhood was freaking out. I mean, that was loud. The kids were screaming. The boards on the house were breaking and crackling. The house even exploded at one point. Like literally huge explosion into the sky above the neighborhood. No one came out of their houses. No sirens, no cops, ambulances, nothing ever came there. It like happened like no one even saw. And then when DJ's parents came back from their trip, they pulled into the driveway. They basically said, hi DJ, walked into the house and didn't even look across the street. I mean, they had to drive by the house to pull back into their driveway. And like the trees were falling all over the road. The house house had been exploded. I mean, how do you not see that and just go about your day? I don't know. I guess like you shouldn't be too logical about a movie. Like I always say, it is just a movie. I'm just showing you how when you're a kid, you sort of just accept things for what they are. You don't really question them. And then when you're older, you're like, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but yeah, that's really like all of my thoughts uh, about the movie. I couldn't really find a lot of deeper meaning like I've found in Coraline or Corpse Bride or Nightmare Before Christmas um, because just the, the meaning is just about the fact that his wife who died in the house was the house and it made that pretty clear in the film so I couldn't find any other hidden symbols necessarily. So that's why this video was more based around what you may not have noticed when you were younger. But like I always say, if you think I missed something or you want to talk about something further, definitely comment down below and also let me know what movie you want me to do next because I do go through your comments and I do pick the movie that is the most commented and if you see that someone's commented about a video that you want me to do definitely give their comment an upvote because that also helps me sort of sort through those as well. Anyways though before I go I do want to talk about the new It 2 trailer. I just gotta say I don't think I've ever seen another horror movie trailer that has freaked me out as much as the It 2 trailer. I am just so excited. The first It was amazing and I just can't wait for this new one. And honestly though guys, it scared me and trailers don't scare me but it scared me. So I just wanna kinda go through it with you guys because like I'm just, I'm that excited. So the first thing we see in this trailer is Beverly arriving at her childhood apartment just to sort of see how things have changed in the past 27 years that she's been away. But if you pay close attention to Beverly during this scene when she's sort of holding up the photo, you can see that on her wrists, there are these red and dark bruises, like someone was holding her arms really tightly. And it's sort of hinting at the fact that Beverly 
grew up with this really abusive father and unfortunately she fell into the same trap again and married an abusive husband. So people are saying that these marks on her wrists are probably from this husband that she's with now. And I think this storyline actually follows the books. Unfortunately, I have not read the books, so I'm not for sure. But then, oh my gosh, this trailer just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So this elderly and very creepy lady named Mrs. Kirsch invites her in for tea. So they sit on the couch, they're drinking tea. But what a lot of people noticed in this trailer is that there's a sign on the door that Beverly reads that says Mrs. Marsh. So not Mrs. Kirsch. And she looks away and looks back at it again and it changes to Mrs. Kirsch all of a sudden. So that was creepy. And people are also saying that the tea she's drinking is not actually real tea. Apparently in the early 90s, they did a mini series about it. And in that series, what she was drinking from her cup was actually blood. But in the novel, it, she was drinking sewer water. So people are saying that it could be one or the other in the actual movie, but it's definitely not tea that she's drinking, which is interesting because you wouldn't know that just by watching the trailer. You have to know about like the novel. And then you see the old photos on the wall, the really old circus photos. The old lady tells her that her father came to the country with only $14 in his pocket and joined the circus. So Beverly sees an old photo of Pennywise without his makeup on, which is really interesting to see because you never see that. You only see the clown makeup. And then because she just saw Pennywise's face, she realizes that she wandered into a trap. And that is when the old lady like runs after her <laughs> and the trailer actually kind of starts. But um, that was just such an interesting clip to be able to see. And it's making me so excited. And if you guys have any sort of plot thoughts or, you know, just thoughts on the trailer, definitely comment that down below. So today we are going to be continuing our awesome movie series and I thought it would be fun to talk about Mary Poppins today. Now for the most part of today's video we're going to be talking about the very first Mary Poppins. So the classic Disney Mary Poppins with Julie Andrews that we all know and love. I know it was before a lot of our times, like it was before my time even, but I know as a kid I still watched it constantly. I know all of the songs, in fact the other day I literally had a spoonful of sugar song stuck in my head constantly. Just a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. The medicine go down. Now that's gonna be stuck in your heads. Anyways, that movie is such a classic one and I always used to watch it at my grandma's house. I have so many memories when I think about it. But when you watch it as an adult or when you watch it a lot later on in your life, you notice things that you didn't really notice when you were a kid. And I'm gonna go over what those things are with you, but a lot of it is kind of dark and kind of very relatable and realistic. Because when you're a kid, you think everything's just fine and dandy and you're watching watching Mary Poppins and you're like, oh, she's so pretty, she can sing really well. But when you're older, you look at it and you're like, darn, I mean, that's, that's deep. So yeah, today we're gonna be going over some of the things that you may not have noticed in Mary Poppins when you were younger. Now, I did watch the new Mary Poppins with Emily Blunt, so at the very end of this video, I'm gonna sort of compare the two and tell you what I thought of the new movie, but we're not gonna get there just yet, so hold, hold your horses. Okay, so here we go. Things only adults will notice in Mary Poppins. It turns out that there are a lot of moments in this movie that go over your head as a kid. If you re-watch it closely as an adult though, you might be surprised to see that the movie is actually a little bit darker than you remember. So we're gonna go through these points and they're not in any particular order, but we're gonna start off with the character Bert. So when you're watching the movie, you kind of notice that Bert seems to be everywhere. We see him at the beginning of the film performing as a one-man band for Spare Change. But then he also has a side job, like being a chimney sweeper or a sidewalk chalk artist. And then we see him being a kite seller. So why is that? Why is he everywhere all of the time doing different things, selling different things, having different jobs? Is he just a free spirit who can't be shackled to a traditional job? Is he taking on these extra jobs because he's not making enough money to make ends meet? It's weird because when I watched this movie as a kid, I never noticed that he was doing a million different things. When I think back to Bert, I always just think of him as a chimney
chimney sweeper. So watching the movie as an adult, Bert becomes a really relatable character because plenty of adults know the struggle of living paycheck to paycheck. So you definitely have to admire the guy's work ethic. And I mean, it's so true. Like clearly he's very dedicated. The next point is that being a chimney sweeper is actually a huge health risk. In the movie, they make his job seem like such a fun time. You guys probably remember them dancing on the rooftops of houses with their cleaning tools. They were singing, having a great time. But little do kids know that these guys regularly breathe in black smoke that completely coats their lungs. In fact, a lot of people died from doing that back then. Going in and out of people's chimneys definitely does a harsh number on you. And when you're a kid watching it, you're just like, oh, it's a musical, they're singing, having a great time. But there's actually a really dark and harsh reality to it. The next point is that the neighbor's house is a safety hazard. The Banks family lives next to a delusional man who thinks his house is a ship. He literally turned the roof of his house into a boat. Not only that, but he actually regularly fires cannons, which causes the neighbor's houses to shake. I mean, why has nobody reported this guy to the police? And how much damage has these cannonballs caused? I mean, they have to be landing somewhere. They don't just like take off into the sky and just disappear. They land like in the middle of the streets. And considering that they're being fired in what appears to be a fairly densely populated area, there have to have been some injuries, if not deaths, from being hit by cannon fire. Surely there must have been at least one neighbor who would have put a stop to this, right? It's just hard to believe that a calm neighborhood would be totally okay with their houses shaking all times of the day. <laughs> Imagine if that was happening in your neighborhood. I feel like your parents would put a stop to it right when it started. I mean, those scenes always really confused me as a child, and I think in my child brain, I actually thought it was a ship or something. I think I was just so confused by what he was doing. Like, is it actually a boathouse? Like, what's happening? I'd always be like, why is there a boat in the middle of the neighborhood? The next point is that Bert has the worst accent ever. So I've actually heard about people complain about this quite a lot. And I must admit, I never noticed his terrible accent as a child, but I'm also Canadian. So I guess his bad accent didn't really register to me. This one is probably more noticeable to English children who grew up watching the movie and most American kids were probably fooled by it because when you're a kid, Bert seems like a funny and totally believable Englishman with a Cockney accent. But when you're an adult and you watch the movie, you realize that no one in real life actually talks like Bert. In fact, Bert's horrendous accent has been criticized for decades since Mary Poppins was released. And even the actor who played him, Dick Van Dyke, acknowledges how bad it is. He knows that he was doing it terribly. And what's pretty funny is that in 2017, Van Dyke received BAFTA's Britannia Award for Excellence in Television. This is what he said during his speech. I appreciate this opportunity to apologize to the members of BAFTA for inflicting on them the most atrocious Cockney accent in the history of cinema. But I mean, at the end of the day, I don't know if it's entirely his fault because he also said that none of the British people working on set during the movie said anything to him. Like they never told him it was wrong. So I guess he didn't realize how terrible it was until people started mentioning it. The next one is why doesn't anybody ever question Mary Poppins? So yes, Jane and Michael are full of mischief, but we all know they're just acting out because they just want love and attention, right? Because their parents really don't give them any attention at all. So it does make sense that they quickly become enamored with Mary Poppins, who seems to be very kind to them. But what doesn't really make sense to me is why no adults really question her about her magical powers. How were they not more skeptical when a woman literally flies in from the sky? Even Mr. Banks is weirdly mesmerized and doesn't question Mary Poppins when presented with evidence that she's wielding some otherworldly powers. Did she just like cast a spell over the entire family? I just felt like everyone was acting like it was totally normal. <laughs> the next question that I think everybody always wonders is where did Mary Poppins get her powers from? You might not have thought of this when you were a kid, but I feel like when you're older watching the movie, you sort of wonder like, but where did she get her powers from? What's her background? What's her history? We really have no background knowledge about her at all. I mean, she doesn't have a magic wand that she casts spells with, so how does she do it? In fact, she doesn't really acknowledge that what she's doing is out of the ordinary. She acts like it's totally normal to be able to clean up a room by snapping her fingers. Like, are magical nannies just a normal thing in that universe? Where does she get her enchanted items, like her bottomless bag of stuff? Is she a witch? What is she? It's actually a little frightening when you think about it because Mary worked her way into the Banks' household by blowing away all of the other applicants with a gust of wind. Do you guys remember that part as a kid when all of the nannies are lined up to get interviewed and 
she just literally blows them away. Literally. Just think about how much damage she could do if she ever decided to use her powers for evil. Because she clearly has a lot of it, so that's kind of scary to think about. The next point is, who the heck is Uncle Albert? When you're watching it as a kid, Uncle Albert seems to be like a funny character. But I feel like as an adult, it raises a lot of questions. So he seems to be well known to Mary and Bert, but it's not clear if he's actually someone's uncle, or is it just his nickname? He doesn't seem to have any magical powers, but he suffers from an affliction that causes him to float to the ceiling when he laughs too much. And then what's even creepier is that he passes on that illness to anybody who's around him. And while this scene is really comical to kids, I know a lot of kids laugh and they find this so hilarious, I think he's actually a really tragic character. Think about it, he's very lonely because the only thing that makes him stop laughing, literally the only thing, is when Mary Poppins say they have to leave. He literally starts crying because we're about to leave him. I don't know, I know when I watched that scene as a kid, Uncle Albert always gave me the creeps. Like, I always felt really unsettled by him. Like, who? He's so random in the movie. The next question is, what is really going on with Mary Poppins and Bert? Like, can we just ask ourselves that question for a second? I feel like they're both very mysterious characters. We know very little about their backgrounds or their lives before they met the Banks family. And it seems evident that they've known each other for a while, but we never know exactly how. When you're a kid and you're watching the movie, I feel like you don't really pick up on that romantic tension. But when you're an adult watching it, you're like, wow, it seems like these guys love each other. Why aren't they acting on it? What, what's their background of their love story? So many questions, you know what I mean? Are Bert and Mary secretly a couple, but hiding it from the children? Are they, are they in love, but unable to be together for some reason? Or is Mary really just a heartless person who's toying with Bert's emotions and stringing him along just for fun? I feel like their relationship is so complicated and is never really explained. And there's actually a really creepy conspiracy theory to follow up with that. And the theory is that Mary Poppins was actually Bert's nanny when he was a kid. Take that in. There is a lyric that Bert is singing that I'm gonna read to you guys that kind of proves that theory. This is what he sings. Because I was afraid to speak when I was just a lad, my father gave my nose a tweak and told me I was bad. But then one day I learned a word that saved my aching nose, the biggest word I ever heard, and this is how it goes. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. So who's the one who came up with that word? it was Mary Poppins. So the theory is that he was having a really rough childhood. His father wasn't treating him well. He was very, very shy. And then suddenly Mary Poppins came into his life and she was singing all these funny songs with him, just like she's doing with the children. Because supercalifragilix, I can't even say it. It's a magical word that only Mary Poppins uses. So there's really no way he could have learned it as a kid unless she taught it to him. And because she never ages, Bert eventually grew up and fell in love with her for changing his life. Life. And also there's another clue at the beginning of the movie that kind of proves this theory as well. In the very beginning, you see Bert say, winds in the east, mist coming in, like something is brewing, about to begin. Can't put my finger on what lies in store, but I feel what's to happen all happened before. AKA, it happened when he was a kid and it's happening again now with her coming back, flying down from the sky. Also, if you think about it, Bert never questions Mary's powers. Not when she's flying and not when she's turning a cloud of smoke into a magic staircase and not even when she bends the law of space, time, and physics to transport them to a magical chalk universe. It just seems to be all normal to him and he's just going along with it. He's having a great time because he knew all of her tricks and her magic from when he was a kid. It just doesn't seem likely that they would have just randomly met on the street. They just don't seem like strangers. You know what I mean? And I actually do believe that conspiracy because I know a lot of the time conspiracies are crazy and out there and you're like, no but this one really does make sense. And the next point is that London is incredibly grim in the movie. Whenever I watched it as a kid, I felt like it was so gray and dark and dreary and gloomy. And honestly, when I was little, I thought that that's how London actually just was in real life because I didn't know any better. To children, Mary Poppins is a film full of whimsical delights. There's singing, dancing, magic, and bright, colorful characters. So it's easy to overlook the grim setting when you're a 
a kid. But as an adult, you realize that the London the Banks family lives in is actually pretty dismal. Everything there is just dark and drab, rather than the bustling city that it actually is. Because I've been to London in real life as an adult, and it's a beautiful place, and it's full of people and crowds and just a lot's going on there, but in the movie, like, it almost seems like you never, you barely see people around. I mean, it's no surprise to me that Jane and Michael were so upset and so down all the time because their atmosphere was so down. But that makes sense to the movie plot because then the happy thing is Mary Poppins coming to be with them. So that's like their joy in the movie, you know what I mean? So I guess the whole atmosphere makes sense, but I feel like as an adult watching back, it seems even darker than I remember it. Anyways though guys, those are all of the points that I'm gonna make about the older Mary Poppins, like the very first movie. And yeah, so I actually saw the new movie about a week ago and I did think it was a pretty good movie. I mean, I feel like the older Mary Poppins was geared towards a bigger audience of people. Like I feel like little kids could watch the old one and older kids can watch the old one. But I feel like this new movie was really geared to like really like young kids, just in my opinion. I just didn't feel like I was fully immersed in the movie because it was so like geared to a younger audience, which makes sense. I mean, it's Mary Poppins, it's, it's a kid's movie. So if I had to give it a rating, I'd probably rate it like a seven out of 10, which isn't a terrible score, but I don't feel like I'd buy the movie and like watch it over and over again, but I would for the older Mary Poppins. But that could just be like the nostalgia in me that likes the older one. I don't know guys. I feel like if I had to compare the two, I'll always go back to the original. But that's just my opinion. Definitely let me know down below what you guys think of the new movie and the old movie. And if there's any points about the old movie that I didn't mention, definitely comment them down below as well. In an enchanted realm, an oddity stirs, beckoning the curious. Meet Jessaline, once ensnared, now awakened, waiting to be yours.